Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ408 and 409. Therapy quote number 408. Margaret Mahler emphasizes the importance of the optimal symbiosis for subsequent differentiation of the self from the object representation, quote, the more the symbiotic partner has helped the infant to become ready to, quote, hatch from the symbiotic orbit smoothly and gradually, that is, without undue strain upon his own resources, the better equipped has the child become to separate out and to differentiate his self-representations from the here through toe fused symbiotic self plus object representations. I think this quote really sort of captures the importance of that symbiotic phase, that extended womb following biological birth. So the main idea is that biological birth and psychological birth don't happen at the exact same time. So the biological birth we can see, it's visible, it's dramatic, it happens in a minute. Um, and the theory is that since babies come out of the womb too early, um, mothers create for the next six months following birth a stage of symbiosis with the baby. Um, so that's like an extended womb. And it's this is the womb for the psychological birth. Th this is this is as important for the psychological birth as the actual womb is for the biological birth. So that stage of symbiosis from birth to six months, it's meant to uh, it's also called the stage of undifferentiation because just like in the actual womb, the baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins. Those boundaries haven't been established. Um, and um, if this stage from birth to six months is uh, optimal, uh, there was no trauma during that time and baby's needs were met and the mother was attuned, everything was safe, warm and comfortable, pretty much like as it was in the womb, the actual womb. It's as safe, warm, comfortable, attuned in the extended womb. That's needed, the theory is, for the baby to hatch out of this symbiotic egg, this orbit she calls it, um, and then from six months to the age of 36 months, to the age of three, the child achieves a psychological birth. Now, if that stage from birth to six months goes awry and there's something something wrong happens, uh, then the child has a developmental trauma. And um, in the future, that can be seen in dysfunctional relationships when the person projects the past onto the present and re-engages in negative symbiosis with the partner and the two people are arguing all the time and conflict habituated hostile dependent or emotional divorce, you see. Uh, because a lot of this hostile, provocative arguing, that's an attempt to reclaim the lost symbiosis. Um, so when there's a developmental trauma or when there's any trauma, there's an attempt to re redo it in the future to try to master it. But beyond the age of five, it, it can't be done. It's called, development, it's called repetition compulsion gone awry or pathological, represent, repes, uh, pathological repetition because no one can travel back in time in a time machine to get the needs met or to change what happened. So if the child didn't get a safe time in the extended womb, um, then he wasn't prepared to go through the developmental stages. You see, so psychically he still um, He's still fused with the image of the mother. So his representation of himself and his psyche and his representation of the other, they're still kind of blurred there. So he never really left the symbiotic egg psychically. That's the theory. If that's the case, when there's a trauma like that, that's, some people believe, that's the origin or the inner world of the narcissistic pattern right there. TQ 409. 
relevant to this paper is the location of the narcissistic personality disorder at the earliest point of the separation individuation process as a fixation of infantile attachment with a failure of complete somatopsychic differentiation. So that stage of undifferentiation didn't get mastered. So psychically, the child and the mother in the child's mind are still bonded. Maybe there's a partial separation, but they're still there, you see. Um, so that developmental trauma is there. Uh, to cope with that, the child may identify with the aggressor, adopt the attitudes and thinking of the parent, the mother. So the person uh, resembles the mother a lot in their thinking and attitudes and um, and then doing to others what was done to them to communicate the, the problem. Or um, because infantile megalomania is unresolved and the child is merged or fused with the omnipotent other. So there's a blending there of the infantile megalomania and the omnipotence of the other. So there's that, so there's like the two factors contributing to the narcissistic pattern. And that's why the person with the narcissistic pattern is always demanding to be one up, is always demanding or attempting to one up over others. Because um, the mother was one up over the child the child becomes the mother. Now, psychically, the person is trying to repeat that. He's caught in that developmental arrest. Right? So again, these two quotes really highlight the importance of how important it is for that extended womb to be warm, safe, attuned. Um, and if there is any prenatal trauma or birth trauma, it can be resolved if from birth to six months. If the attachment is secure enough, all those past traumas can be resolved. Uh, sometimes, if the prenatal trauma is too severe, or if the birth trauma is too severe, it's possible they may interfere with the ability of the mother and the child to form a secure attachment. And we had that quote yesterday about prenatal trauma. Uh, I was thinking about it a little bit, you know, the people, the mother thought that because she felt the baby kicking, she was so excited and happy that the baby was kicking, and then she called everybody over, come, look, the baby, feel, touch, look, it's kicking, everyone's so excited, they think, they, it was a huge disconnect, the baby was under huge duress, the baby was frightened and scared, uh, in, in one case, it was uh, presented that the baby, it was believed that the baby had the cord twisted around his leg, and he was couldn't breathe properly and he was frightened and terrified so he was fighting for his life practically he was extremely scared and then the people on the outside were thinking this was a great thing and the baby on the inside is suffering immensely and it was like this huge disconnect that people couldn't consider the possibility of the baby being traumatized but as uh, Janice said um, in yesterday's quote and in his material there's no doubt about it babies can be traumatized in the womb and if it's severe uh, it can possibly interfere with the mother's ability to offer a secure attachment style after birth and that would lead to a developmental trauma All right. you know that disconnect between people not imagining that the baby kicking is uh, under a great duress or could be under great duress if it's just a momentary little thing maybe it's nothing but if the baby's kicking con remember at the rock concert for 30 minutes the baby was wildly flailing about kicking wildly in the belly and it finally forced the mother was forced was escorted out to stop the to save the baby kind of thing something like that so it, prenatal stress prenatal duress or prenatal distress syndrome does exist you know? and we had all these other previous uh, quotes about uh, prenatal trauma about the monkeys and and, uh, and uh, I think there was another one as well so anyways um, so 
th there's a real importance for the baby to feel safe in the womb. And then when the birth takes place, it's called the lotus birth, the birth, the baby is smoothly handed to the mother right away. The cord stays, the placenta can stay. The placenta will come out a day later and it can be put in a bowl and it can sit beside the mother. You know, um, remember the cord is a part of the baby and the placenta is a part of the baby. They were his companions. They were his guides, you know, he was a support system. They were his support system. Leave it on there. You want to make the transition as smooth as possible so the baby doesn't feel that there's a shock there. So you don't want birth trauma. Um, if there is some disturbance, it may not be enough to cause the trauma and the child can still bond and a secure attachment is made. But if the birth trauma is very severe, uh, the baby may not want to bond with the mother. The baby's scared of the mother. You know. So, um, anyways, uh, the point is, um, so let's say uh, there's no birth trauma, or it's, and there's no prenatal trauma, and now an extended womb is offered from birth to six months. So let's say the biological birth is okay. Now we're looking for the psychological birth, which is what this series is about, the psychological birth. So to get the psychological birth, now our starting point is from birth to six months, the stage of symbiosis. Okay, she says here, Mahler, Margaret Mahler emphasizes the importance of the optimal symbiosis, the optimal symbiosis for subsequent differentiation of the self from the other representation. Okay. The more the mother has helped her baby to become ready to hatch from the symbiotic egg orbit smoothly and gradually, that is without due strain upon the baby's resources, the better equipped has the baby become to separate out and to differentiate his self-representation from this fused self-mother representation. So then you get the sep you need that separation. Once that separation has taken place, the child has ontological, the foundation for ontological security. He can achieve ontological security at the age of three. If he doesn't get that smooth uh, transition out of the egg, if he's traumatized during that symbiotic egg, he's gonna miss, he's gonna miss the, the foundational requirements to achieve the ontological security at the age of three. So assuming, so again, uh, that first six months is so key. And during the symbiosis, the baby has a need, the mother meets the need. No, the mother is not, shouldn't gaslight the baby. The mother shouldn't say, no baby, you're gonna eat when I say, and you're not, you're gonna sleep when I say, or you're gonna wake up when I tell you to eat. You can't do all these kinds of things. The life of the baby from birth to six months should be treated with him being the little god that he was in the womb. He's meant to be a little god from birth to six months during that time. He's the boss. He's let him be the god from birth to the golden child, whatever, from birth to six months. Allow that and let him meet everything he, he needs, just like all of his needs were met in the womb. Because babies come, human babies come out too early, so we offer that extended womb from birth to six months. And that sets the stage for the hatching process to achieve the psychological birth. So as mentioned before, if it goes well, if the stage of symbiosis goes well, remember if it doesn't, that led to the bully pattern we had in the previous quote. The bully was provocative and hostile and looking around trying to cause trouble because he was trying to recreate the symbiosis that he never got. See, he can't do it. That's why he's causing so much trouble and he's disturbed. He's caught in the repetition compulsion of the developmental trauma of not getting his, symbi his symbiotic needs met. That's, never mind people with trauma after the, after the six months. That's not that harmful, but look how harmful it is to, to have a, a child not experience his symbiotic needs met. He's gonna be very uh, uh, aggressive. Uh, uh, but the positive intention is um, he's trying to recapture or regain or at least communicate that he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. So at best he's trying to say, I never got my symbiotic needs met. 
So the bully wants someone to mirror him perfectly, to do everything he says, to follow him perfectly, to be at his beck and call, just like the mother was supposed to be at the baby's beck and call. Okay, so let's say the symbiotic uh, egg was okay. The mother just needs to be good enough. The positive memories need to outweigh the negative memories. That's good enough. Now the child is able to hatch out of this um, fusion, of the self and other fusion. Now the child can create a psychic representation of himself that's separated from the representation of the other. Well, that's a huge accomplishment. That, that's uh, very important. That's the foundation for the ontological security at the age of three. So let's, now let's say he has that. And then the rest is not, the rest is pretty easy actually for the mother. The child's going to play with toys and uh, he's going to explore around a little bit. And uh, between two and three, he's going to want to do more things on his own without his mother's presence. The mother welcomes that. Of course, you know, of course she's protecting him, right? I, I'm, but the child, what the child's going to do is um, he's going to run back to the mother for emotional refueling as needed between two and three. That's the rapprochement subphase. So that's fine. Mother's happy to do that. And then by the age of three, the child has fully internalized all those loving memories, all those experiences, and he has what's called ontological security, a holding introject. Basic trust, Erickson called it. He has that internal basic that forms his psychic structure. Now he's individuated. He has a psychological individuation. He's separated out of the fusion with the mother, and he has his uh, representation of himself. Right? So the psychic umbilical cord, his life force is connected to himself now. He's achieved a psychological birth. If the life force is still attached to the mother, he hasn't achieved it yet. That's the theory. But uh, so a secure attachment style all the way through from birth to three is needed for the psychological birth. And with the psychological birth, with uh, the life force connected to himself, uh, he, has, he now has access. That's the key to his real self, the treasures of the real self. Now he knows his own unique individual wishes. Now he knows what gifts he were given for his uniqueness. Uh, he feels happy to... Uh, Express himself from his unique, uh, his, from his uniqueness. He, he has a, his own personality, as I, right? Um, it's not, it's not a personality in rebellion against the mother, with the insecure attachment. It's all rebellion against the mother, but with the secure attachment, so he can express himself. He, he can set a goal. He can learn. He's, he's curious, wide range of feelings. He's in touch with himself. He can. Whole object relations are there. He can relate to others as whole objects because he has a representation of himself. It's a whole, and the other is also a whole. So he has mutual relating there. He doesn't exploit others and need others. He's not trying to extract something from others. He's, that's not. He, he has ontological security, right? Uh, and then uh, all the capacities of the real self are available to him, right? Uh, and another video. By Masterson talked about he had the list there of the capacities of the real self. You know, so he's emotionally free. He's achieved individuation, the psychological birth, and uh, he'll have healthy relationships. And uh, he's caring. He's warm. He's creative. His humor is helpful. It's fun. And uh, um, see, with the insecure attachment style, the humor is bitter, sarcastic, biting. You see. It's anger at the mother, all that sarcasm. It's biting. It's bitter. It's it's biting the mother. You see, it's it's a, a lot of anger there. Most most comedians come from an insecure attachment style, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I I just really think more. It's worth highlighting this point about. Uh, we, we have the womb for the biological birth, okay? Now we need a womb for the psychological birth. That's the stage of symbiosis from birth to six months. That needs to be respected and, uh, and the baby needs to be the golden child for those six months, you know? And then he achieves the 
a representation of himself as being, he's differentiated out of the orbit, the symbiotic orbit, the fusion orbit. If he doesn't, and he's stuck there, okay, then there's, that leads to all the dysfunctional patterns in neurotic living and, and so on. Okay, I guess I'll just leave it here. So this has been TQ408 and 409. Uh, a little bit more on the theory of how biological birth uh, doesn't automatically, that with the biological birth, that doesn't automatically include a psychological birth, that they're different. And that to get the psychological birth, we create a psychological womb, and then we hatch, so there's the egg there, and then we slowly hatch out of the egg. And from six months to 36 months, the mother welcomes the child's growing individuation. Okay, A Jocasta mother doesn't welcome it. The Jocasta mother wants the child to stay dependent on her because the mother's using the child to meet her dependency needs. So the mother's parentifying the baby. So that's, that's, that's a... So uh, there were other videos about the Jocasta mothering style. So let's assume that the Jocasta mothering style is not there. We have a healthy mothering style where the mother understands that the child is autonomous. It's going to want to separate and be his own self. And she supports that. And uh, she doesn't have this overly possessive, you know, your mind and you're going to do what I say. Like, oh boy, oh no, that's the Jocasta mothering style. And Virginia Satir had that quote. We played a clip from Virginia Satir. She said, uh, Dear parents in the audience listening, please don't tell your children that you gave them life. You created the conditions for it and you, you house their bodies, but you don't occupy their souls like that. You don't use them like that. You know, they're, they're, uh, uh, and then we had that poem from Gibran um, about this as well. Okay. Uh, I'll leave it here. So thank you very much. Uh, this has been TQ408 and 409. More to follow. Thank you. Bye for now.